But if somebody had taken the time to read all of Paul's writings, they would see that and go, wait a minute, what's going on here? And it's only then that they would realize that Paul was giving advice regarding a certain specific situation. If they went, if that person went a little bit further and looked at how the Bible talks about women, they'd get a pretty confusing picture. Some women are not held in high regard today. Eve, some others. And yet there are some women who are held in very high esteem. Names like Rahab, Miriam, Mary, Rachel, Deborah. In fact, some of those women, if they didn't do what they did, if they, if, if they had not experienced what they had, we might not have Christianity. You could almost say that they were the key to our history. They should have looked at Paul and said, hey, wait a minute, what's going on? Sometimes we intentionally ignore the rules. And if you look at history, art, architecture, you can see people that did just exactly this. A little piece of music history trivia, J.S. Bach wrote a series of pieces of music to prove that the rules were wrong. <coughs> he wrote the rules intentionally. And he made a point. Take a look at George Gershwin. He did the same thing. You look at Frank Lloyd Wright, and he built this house. He designed this house out in western Pennsylvania. I've seen it. It's beautiful from the outside. But he had it wrong. And this time, I don't think it was intentional. Because if you go in that house, it looks like a rat maze in a, lab, in a psychology lab. <laughs> Not the kind of place I'd want to live, thank you all the same. But it goes against the grain. Some people just do what goes against the grain anyway. Let's take a look at Noah. Noah's out there in the desert. And God says, I want you to build an ark. Okay? Why would you build an ark in the middle of the desert? that God was putting pieces in place planning for the future. So Noah goes out there and he starts building this ark. And he's an old man. He starts building this ark. That's unusual. Now I've, I've heard when I was growing in my growing up years, we lived in Pennsylvania and we would go visit my grandparents down Pocahontas in Delaware, just outside Wilmington. As we were going there, Dad told me one time of this man who built a boat in his basement. He's a retiree. I thought nothing of it. Until my dad told me that the man had built the thing out of concrete. For those who don't know, concrete does not float. Or, well, it would, but water and concrete are not a happy combination. He also built it so big that he couldn't get it through the doors to take it outside the basement. It went against the grain. So Noah's building this boat. How big was it? I mean, I, I've heard of people making small boats, you know, like sailboats and things like that. We're talking here about a boat that was somewhere be between the size of a Coast Guard cutter. A fairly small ship, maybe 100 feet long. And an Iowa class battleship, maybe a thousand feet long. Depends on a lot of things that, well, we won't get into it, but there's a lot of if this, if that. But what Noah did went against the grain. He's building floating zoo, and oh, by the way, don't 
get me started on termites on a wooden boat. <laughs> God that calls on us to go against the grain all the time. And Jesus tells us, love your neighbor, pray for your enemies. That goes against the grain. Maybe because God has faith in our better nature, such as it is in what there is of it. I'll point fingers at myself and say that yes, there are times when I am tempted to take revenge on people. But I don't. At least I hope I don't. But he does this. God does things that in our lives that don't make sense. I remember sitting here, or maybe over the cross the way as maybe, and hearing Brother Bob talk from time to time about how when he was a younger man, God called him to the ministry. And if I'm right and I pray, I'm right. And if I'm wrong, Brother Bob, if you're listening, please forgive me. But I was left with the impression that he kind of said, wait a minute, God, what's going on here? might be setting things in place for the future. But there's more to this whole love your enemies thing than just going against the grain. Back five, six, eight hundred years ago, people couldn't read the Bible. And church leaders said, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to convey, portray some of the events of the Bible? And they came up with what they call mystery plays. The idea was it is better to show than tell. So when we go against the grain, we're following God. But more importantly, we are showing everyone around us a picture of who God is and what He's all about. That's one. Two, it's practice. Now, they say that practice makes perfect. I can tell you that that ain't true by about 10,000 kilometers. Practice does make better, but it never makes perfect. We practice things all the time. Doctors practice medicine. Lawyers practice law. We practice being Christians, following Jesus and going where he leads us, where God leads us. We don't always get it right. But we don't just do the easy things. They come easy. That's why they're called easy things. We go over the hard stuff. And it's hard. It's cruel hard to love the people who hate you. It's hard to be nice to the people that say mean things to you and about you. But as we practice that, if we put that into practice, yes, it's a struggle at first. Yes, it's impossible at first. But eventually, over time, with endless repetition, what starts out as a struggle becomes a great habit. With that struggle, we step just a little bit closer to God. We follow Him more closely. We don't just follow God more closely. We are portraying God to other people. Sometimes those other people might see us do something that goes against the grain of human nature and say, wait, what? <clears throat> What's going on here? And 
and maybe, just maybe, they'll learn something about what it is to be Christian. That is the kind of moment, that wait what moment, when somebody has the potential to learn. And when I say someone, I include us. Those are the kinds of wait what moments we need to worry about. We need to be on the lookout for them, and we need to be ready to capitalize on them. Other wait what moments are when we don't apply, we realize that we're not applying our rules right or applying the wrong rules. Again, wait what? It's time to reevaluate. To look at what is going on. Are we doing the right thing? Are we making the right judgments? Does it always happen that way? And then there are those wait what moments when we don't have the information we need. We can throw those away. Doesn't matter. Because when we have faith in God, it will work out. I've stood before any number of congregations now. I've led any number of classes. I've done any number of things in public. Things have not always gone quite right. In fact, I would say most of the time, they don't go right. An example of this morning is we had our offering in our offertory, and then Stephen played some special music. By the way, Stephen, very nice. Done. Good choice. But it caught me off guard. I'm like, wait, what's going on? I was expecting one thing. I didn't know that something else was planned. It didn't matter. Because it's all good. I said to myself, well, God's got something else in mind than what I had in mind. Okay, we'll go with what God's got. We take it on faith. We just let God deal with the details, and we just get on with our lives of following Him. It takes a little bit of stress, but it takes a lot of other stress out of our life. I can't control it. No, no, just let somebody else deal with it. Take it on faith that they are and they will. Sometimes we don't have the right information. God calls us to do something that is completely out of character even for us or what we think he wants us to do. Just go with it. Know that God is there. He's planning. He's looking ahead. He's got our best interests at heart. <coughs> now the real trick, and this is a trick, I'll, I'll, I'll admit that I'm not, I'm not even very good at it, but how do we know what's going on? How do we know when we should just let it go? When our confusion is just because we don't know what's going on and we should just let it go? How do we know when our confusion is because we're not following correctly? And how do we know when our confusion is there to teach ourselves or maybe somebody else? That's one that I've been trying to figure out for well longer than I've been married, and that's a long time. I haven't gotten there. But I know that one of these days, hopefully not tomorrow, but probably in about 30, 40 years, I'll understand it a little better. We'll see. I don't have enough information. In the meantime, let's just pray. Very 
Gracious God, we don't know. We say wait what all the time. Teach us to know the difference, and when we do need to pay attention to those things. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mark. Our hymn sending us forth today is number 389 in the Red Hymnal. Freely, freely. Verses 1 and 2. Continue to bless us throughout this week as we minister to others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now would the ushers come forward that we may offer our tithes, offerings, and gifts to God. <coughs> We give so little, but may it expand to bless and enlarge your kingdom in your holy name. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Stephen. Wow. Our Lord's words today come from Matthew chapter 5, 47, or 43 to 47, and Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. You have heard that it was said, You must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you, so that you will be acting as children of your Father who is in heaven. He makes the sun rise on both the evil and the good, and sends rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men with skin diseases approached him. Keeping their distance from him, they raised their voices and said, Jesus, Master, show us mercy. When Jesus saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. As they left, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he had been healed, returned and praised God with a loud voice. He fell upon his face at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus replied, Weren't ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? No one returned to praise God except this foreigner. Then Jesus said to him, Get up and go. Your faith has healed you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our hymn of preparation is in your method seminal again, number 420. Breathe on me, breath of God. Verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. this morning. 
Some things that I had anticipated happening in worship didn't. Some things that I didn't did. A surprise. Our passages, our, our text this morning, looks first at an interaction between Jesus and ten lepers. Andy read script which described them as having skin diseases, but I've always heard the term lepers apply to these men. They did something unusual. They would have been required by law to warn Jesus away, or if not healthy, or contagious, keep your distance. They didn't do that. They said, Jesus, Master. Have mercy. Now they were required by the laws of their day to ward Jesus off. They didn't do that. And instead of asking for a handout or for someone to provide some medical care, they called Jesus Master. And the Greek word that they use there denotes someone who is placed in authority, the boss, if you like. They said, have mercy. Well, these men weren't warranting. They weren't allowed to be as part of the mainstream society. And we think, well, that doesn't happen all that often. Well, if you get COVID, you're supposed to stay away. And even if you're allowed to rejoin society, you're still kind of expected to wear the mask, which is a sign. Keep your distance. I'm dangerous. How did those men know who Jesus was? Did they hear stories, rumors, and they maybe met him before? It's possible. Jesus when he encountered these men, was described by Luke as being on his way to Jerusalem for the last time. Or maybe they didn't know anything. Because they were away. But if that was the case, then maybe God inspired them to call him Master. Jesus, for his part, did something unusual himself. And normally, Jesus would interact with whoever spoke to him. He would talk to them. He would tell them their sins are forgiven. He would tell them to get up and walk away. He would touch them. Jesus didn't do any of those things. Instead, he just said, go see the priests. Is that a character even for Jesus? So they went. And one of those men, as he was going, realized, hey, wait a minute, I've been healed. And he turned around and went back and he thanked Jesus. Then Luke draws our attention to the fact that that was a Samaritan, and that would have surprised the heck out of his original readers. <clears throat> Jews and Samaritans had this wonderful love-hate relationship going on. They loved to hate each other. The typical Jew of the typical Israelite of their day would have thought, now why would a Samaritan, who rates lower than even the worst of politicians today, do that? It's not right. We would read this and we would think, wait, what's going on here? Why did that one Samaritan come back? Luke was making a point. He was talking about the nature of grace. But he was also using this moment, what I call a wait what moment, as a teaching tool. Now, there are several kinds of wait what moments. If we look, for example, at Abraham. And 
There's old Abraham, and God says, Abraham, I want you to take Isaac. I want you to go sacrifice him. Wait a minute, what? You, God, promised me that I was going to be the father of a great nation, and I assume it's through Isaac, and you want me to sacrifice him? What's going on? What Abraham did not know was first that he had no intention that Isaac would die. And he had already put plans in place to make that not happen. God still wanted a sacrifice. And Abraham did not know that there was a ram stuck in some bushes close by that could be used as a sacrifice. <clears throat> Abraham was looking ahead. He didn't have all the information he had needed. But that kind of lack of information goes the opposite direction, too. Picture, if you will, the scene. King Saul is in his throne room. His advisors and his military men are there. And he is saying, God has told me to slay the Amalekites. And those men are kind of like, okay... And they, Saul goes on, he says, I want all the men killed, I want all the women killed, I want all the children killed, I want all their domesticated animals killed, I want their buildings raised to the ground. It doesn't matter, young, old, income, gender, doesn't matter, kill them all. Some of his my advisors might be saying, wait a minute, God is a God of mercy and he wants these people destroyed? Why? They might be saying, wait, what? This is a God of mercy, and he wants this nation eradicated, erased from the face of the planet. <coughs> it's not until they look at the history of the relationship between the Amalekites and God that they understand that the Amalekites had sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned and disappointed God time after time after time and again. And God had finally decided that even after his long patience had given out, and it was time to do something. We don't know. And that leads us to ask, wait, what? Sometimes these wait what moments are because we don't apply the rules and guidelines correctly, or we apply the wrong ones. We take a look at Job and his friends. They were all convinced that if they did not sin, if they did not offend God, they would not suffer. Job's friends made that point at great length to Job. And yet they were all wrong. They didn't understand the rules governing their relationship, which said, yes, you get right with God and you are still going to suffer. It's going to happen. <clears throat> they thought that obeying the rules, staying right with God, conferred immunity from suffering. They were wrong. They didn't apply the rules right. We see the same thing happening today in how we govern and lead our churches. Now, I'm not pointing fingers here, except maybe at myself. There are some who would say that women are not allowed to do, take leadership roles in the pulpit, in the church. And they would point to a passage in one of Paul's letters to Corinth, 